Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So thank you so much to everyone for coming here today, especially Dr. Checker. And like I mentioned before, if you would like to do so, please introduce yourselves in the chat. My name is Sydney Fierig and I am a senior here at the college. I study history and environmental science. And today we are going to hear from Dr. Checker about her background. She is the Hagerdorn Professor of Urban Studies at Queens College and a faculty member in the PhD program in anthropology at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. She has authored numerous academic articles, book chapters, popular articles, and renowned books on environmental justice, including her book, Polluted Promises, Environmental Racism, and the Search for Justice in a Southern Town, that earned an Association for Humanistic Sociology Book Award, and was a finalist for the Julian Stewart Award and the Delmos Jones and Jagna Scharf Memorial Book Prize. Tonight at 6.30, she will be discussing her work documented in her newly published book, The Sustainability Myth, Environmental Gentrification, and the Politics of Justice. Dr. Checker's work on environmental gentrification has had a large impact on my own research, as it has inspired my ongoing thesis in parks in Richmond, Virginia. She is a true inspiration for environmental advocacy, and I know that I can speak for all of us when I say that we're excited to hear what she will share with us today. Today's discussion will be organized as follows. I'll first turn the floor over to Dr. Checker to speak about her background in environmental gentrification and her career path before we devote the rest of our time to answering some of your questions. I have a few previously submitted questions that I will be using, but if anyone has a question, don't hesitate to type it into the chat at any time. Again, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today, Dr. Checker. I know that we are all excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Dr. Checker, I don't believe we can hear you very oh, well. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. There we go. I can hear you now. Thank you. I muted myself and I forgot. Well, I, I just said uh, thank you to Sydney and Erica for organizing this and for inviting me. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And I, I'm very flattered that um, I inspired your work. So um, that's, that's great to hear. I, I will tell you a little bit um, to start off about the things that have inspired me um, to do this work and um, how I sort of got into it, um, starting with when I was, well, really it, it sort of um, a little bit about um, my college experience where I, I was interested in college and um, I was an urban studies minor and I was very interested in urban problems, especially problems of ho uh, homelessness and affordable housing. And that was kind of really my main thing. And when I graduated from college, I went to California and I worked for a nonprofit that developed affordable housing. And I really thought that I was gonna to go to graduate school and continue to study problems of homelessness and housing. And um, I, you know, I started my graduate degree in anthropology at NYU. And uh, when it got time for me to do, I had, we had to do a master's thesis um, on the way to our PhD. And so I was kind of scouting around for a topic for my master's thesis and, you know, the environment had never been, I mean, it was something I obviously cared about, but it wasn't really like my issue that really motivated me to activism so as much as poverty. Um, and I kind of thought of the environment like a lot of people do as kind of more of a, a middle class white issue about recycling and that's sort of were my associations with it. Um, but my advisor uh, at NYU said, you know, you should look into this issue of environmental justice. And there's this big um, case going on in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg. And um, I think it's really interesting and you should have a look. And, and in Williamsburg, what was happening was there was a neighborhood, there's a large population of Hasidic Jews who are ultra Orthodox Jews and also a large population of Latinx people. And they had historically really fought with each other over access to housing and schools. And so they, they were kind of always sort of battling with the city for, um, to get more affordable housing for their communities. But they had come together to fight the installation of an incinerator in their neighborhood because they, their neighborhood was already really polluted. Um, it has a highway that goes through it, a bridge um, and some other, industrial facilities. So 
that the the incinerator had really brought them together and for them it was this really big deal that they were cooperating and working um as a team and they they kept so i started going to their meetings and um I found that they were using this idea of the environment as a unifier and they were saying we all breathe the same air. And so we, you know, we should not be fighting anymore because um, the, you know, clean air is something that we all need access to. And it had also led them to see that they all were kind of that, you know, they shouldn't be fighting against each other for housing, that they should be working together for more housing for everybody. So the environment really served as this kind of metaphor for unity and for the ways that they could, um, that they all needed access. And so that really interested me. And I started wondering about the environment as more of a social justice issue and as um, access to clean environments as something that was not that dissimilar for, from access to housing and employment and all of the resources that people need, you know, to live. Um, and so I started really, you know, um, getting into this idea of environmental justice. And then I decided to continue studying it for my dissertation research. And in that case, I wanted to go to the US South because um, I had never lived in the South. And um, also be, so it was sort of, you know, different for me. Um, and I really wanted to look at how maybe environmental, the environmental justice movement was drawing on civil rights rather than, so it wasn't really drawing on the same things that mainstream environmentalism, what I call mainstream environmentalism, which is more sort of about wilderness conservation and nature preservation. But this movement looked really different because it was more about protecting people from the environment rather than protecting the environment from people. And I really wanted to look at like the different um, ways that people thought about the environment. So I was looking at a group of, um, I went to, ended up going to a, a very small neighborhood in Augusta, Georgia. It was um, about 98% African-American, mostly low income um, and working class people. And they were surrounded by um, seven polluting facilities. So they called themselves the hole in a toxic donut and they were fighting to, um, their, one of those facilities had, had contaminated their, um, um, their, their land. Um, and so they were trying to get relocated. And so I, I ended up working with them for quite a long time um, and looking at how they were organizing for relocation and how they understood this problem of environmental racism. Like how did they see the environment as something that would be subject to racism? And it, of course, it went along with a lot of other kinds of structural racism. And there's a lot of reasons, which I think I'll probably talk about in the questions and answers. Um, but I worked with, you know, I, I ended up, um, because they were activists and I'm an anthropologist and my method is participant observation, I um, was able to kind of embed with their organization that, that was fighting for environmental justice. So I basically volunteered full time and that was kind of what I did in the field. And, and that was great because it enabled me to be an activist and also to you know, learn a lot about what, they, what these people were doing with their activism and what their histories were, what other kinds of activism they were involved with, um, the role of religion and how that factored into their activism. It was, it was a really great experience. Um, and so I, I wrote my first book about, about that. Um, and so I was still, so that was, you know, I was doing that kind of work for a while um, in the South. And then I got, um, I got a new job in New York. At that time I was living in Memphis, Tennessee where I had my first job. So I, I got another job in New York in 2007. And um, I was really happy to move back to New York because I missed it. And I was really interested to see what had happened to environmental justice since I had lived there before. And um, I still was interested in that topic, but what I thought about at that point in 2007, because there was this big kind of building boom going on in New York City, a lot of condos going up, a lot of neighborhoods gentrifying rapidly. Um, Michael Bloomberg was the mayor and he was really pro-development and, and he was, doing all this development under this um, rubric of sustainability. And the, the activists that I knew had been talking about sustainability for a really long time. 
um, you know, for, for longer than Bloomberg had been talking about it. So I thought, well, maybe this is going to be a great thing for, for the environmental justice movement, because now it's like gone mainstream, like the idea of sustainability. And um, I really wanted to see how it was working out and if it was helping uh, the cause of environmental justice. So um, I started networking with activists in New York City. Um, mostly I met them through the people I knew in Augusta because um, EJ activists are very well networked across the country. And um, so I started, you know, kind of learning about the different groups in New York City and what the issues were in different neighborhoods and um, looking at how gentrification was affecting them. And, um, and that's what led me to the research uh, that's in the book that uh, was just published, The Sustainability Myth. And I found that, um, unfortunately, uh, the way that sustainability was playing out in New York City was not really helping environmental justice that much because what happened was as neighborhoods got these, you know, to new parks and new amenities and started to green, you know, like they would get um, uh, maybe parks and bike lanes, farmers markets, new green buildings, green roofs, all these great things that, that people in the neighborhood absolutely wanted and had been fighting for for a long time but they came along with much higher property values and rents. And so people were facing this question of like, do we ask for the green improvements and improve our environment only to get, you know, um, have the neighborhood become unaffordable? Or, you know, they were sort of boxed into a corner in a way where they either fought for the things they needed and risked displacement, or they stopped fighting for the things they needed and live in a neighborhood that was polluted. So. Um, that's what I was really looking at. So maybe I, should I stop there and go to questions? Sure, of course, if you want to. That was very interesting to hear and I think helpful for all of us. So one question that we have received is how can we create accessible, casual, usable green spaces in cities without gentrifying the area or inviting predatory development? Yeah, that is really the big question. Um, that comes out of this. And um, I think we can. I, I think that it's it's possible. I don't think it's easy necessarily, but I think that um, there are cases and um, there are a few cases where if you kind of um, can really be thoughtful about it and put in, implement um, a lot of affordable housing, basically. So you really, you can still have the, the high-end development, but making sure that it's really mixed with um, maintaining the affordable housing and you know increasing even affordable housing in that area. And the, and the ways that some people do that are through land trusts where you kind of take land and, and really designate it. Um, and uh, so it, the trust is owned by either the people that live there or by some nonprofits that are gonna ensure it's affordable um, or that you kind of have um, fairly a, a pretty good balance so that you kind of can regulate um, a, a much better balance of housing and mix. Thank you very much. If anyone present today has any questions, don't hesitate to type them in the chat at any point. So the next question that someone has raised um, along the theme of gentrification is about your 2011 paper in which you note that plans for creating green spaces were often accompanied by plans for high density development, which would create more pollution than the green space would counter. These kinds of development mentioned are luxury apartments and expensive condos, which would bring more um, harm associated with gentrification. If high density section eight housing was proposed instead, would the benefit of accessible housing outweigh the increased environmental pressures? Well, that's a really difficult question. Um, also a good one. You know, I think, um, I'm, you know, uh, that's tough. I, I kind of feel like, I don't really think we need, at least in New York City, we don't really need high density section eight housing. The thing with New York City is there's a lot of already existing housing stock. And um, I'm not sure new construction is really what's needed. I think it's more protecting the units that are currently affordable. 
and perhaps creating more affordable units out of what we already have, because we have a lot of vacancies in New York. So I don't think we need to be building so much and, um, and it's not good for the environment. So I think there's a way that you could kind of do both. That's great to hear. Um, so the next question is more open-ended. So this person asks, if you have any suggestions on how to mitigate the displacement of historical groups if and when environmental gentrification takes place. Um, yeah, again, I think, you know, making sure that the people that there's affordable housing, that there are protections for the people who li already live there, that they so they don't have to move. Um, and that could be through uh, rent stabilization, um, strengthening it, or through um, Section 8, pro you know, Section 8 programs, or, you know, there's all kinds of ways we have, um, New York has a a lot of different affordable housing programs. And it's really, instead of like chipping away at them as we have been doing for so long, really strengthening them and fortifying them. Excellent, thank you. So the next question is, if, if you have come across any examples of sustainable improvements that did not result in gentrification. In other words, is it possible to have environmental reform that does not displace those who are disproportionately affected by poor environmental conditions? Yeah, there's, um, there's an example going on right now in Washington, D.C. that I'm following that um, they were going to build another Highline Park across the Anacostia River. And um, what happened was the people on the Anacostia side who have been living in who are mostly low income, um, you know, were really concerned about it. And they, they a whole bunch of nonprofits in the DC area got together and they started buying up the land to create a land trust so that all of the land that was like right on the other side of the bridge for, I'm not sure what the radius is, but a particular radius around there would remain affordable. And um, so that, and those are the people that will be closest to the park. So they'll really actually get to enjoy the park and stay in their housing. And then they can build luxury housing beyond that, but um, th those people will get the best access to it. So that's an interesting example. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. And then another question, this is our last one along the theme of gentrification specifically. Um, this one, um, they ask, based on your 2011 paper, it seems as though one of the most important aspects of combating environmental gentrification, whether accidental or purposeful, is to make sure um, to center the voices of the people who already live in the community. Many developers, developers and planners do not seem to follow this principle, and I'm wondering how you suggest we as students can push for this to occur in our own community of Williamsburg and James City County. Wow, okay. Well, um, I think, yeah, I think that, I think that's absolutely, I agree with that, that centering people's voices and letting people actually really sort of speak up for what they want in their neighborhood and the kind of mix of um, the kind of mixture of people that they want in their neighborhoods is really important. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's getting involved and going to the meetings and trying to sort of, I mean, I know you, some of you guys probably aren't from there or don't, haven't lived there for a long time, but you can help to amplify the voices of the people that do and that really um, are trying to speak up for for the kind of neighborhood that they want. And I think that there's a place for everybody to kind of go and, and support and, and sort of um, play that role of saying, well, wait a minute, this, you know, what about what that person said? And, you know, there's a lot that you can kind of do in um, public meetings to, to amplify those voices or to write op-eds or to, you know, just support whatever local organizations there are that are fighting against gentrification. Excellent. Lauren, who is here today, just raised an excellent question. Lauren asks, in environmental economics, you have to assign a high value to environmental goods in order to get politicians or stakeholders to care about them. Given this, how can we get environmental protection and evaluation without raising housing prices? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I'm not an economist, so I'm sure you know more about that kind of valuation than I do. Um, but I think there are, I mean, I think um, if you, and you know, again, this is sort of out of my area of expertise, but 
if you factor in the costs, right? So there's always externalities that you can factor in that would diminish the benefits or that would diminish the, you know, that kind of mitigate the value in a way. So I, I think it really depends on how you're, like, I think that maybe that assumption can be re-examined that you have to value things in this, in terms of property values or high property values, um, especially if you're factoring in the social costs and the environmental costs, and maybe there's another way to, to value it um, that doesn't involve raising the prices. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if you're talking about the cost, like it is expensive to build green housing, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And um, I don't think that, I think you can put install like green amenities that don't um, have to spike the housing prices quite so much either. And I, you know, yeah. Uh, um, so maybe there's more of a balance that can be reached. Great, thank you. I hope that answered your question, Lauren. So our next question is more focused on your 2011 essay. This person asks, what are your ideas for a solution? The essay sadly ends without a happy ending and it was difficult to piece together a solution to this paradox. Yeah, so this is, you're talking about the Green Wave article, right? Um, yeah, so um, it's true. It doesn't have a very happy ending, but it's sort of, well, let me think if I can, um, you know, what happened, I can tell you what actually happened if, if you want to hear what happened, which isn't so, it's, it's interesting. I'll tell you, uh, there's, a, there's a happy side of it, a part of it, I guess, which is that, so that, um, park never got uh, that park never got done redone uh, the way they wanted it to. I mean, it got a like a little bit spruced up, but um, it pretty much remained the same the way that the community members wanted it. Um, but there's another park in Harlem that was um, that I think I talk about in that article that we act. It was on the river, and it was something that we act. Um, uh, the nonprofit, the environmental justice nonprofit was like really in charge of. And, and throughout the process, as they, it took like 10 years for them to build this park and they had hotels and different kinds of private entities that wanted, that said, oh, you know, we'll give you some money to build this park and make it really nice if you let us locate nearby or on the property. And, and they fought all of it off and said, we, you know, we don't need your fancy things and um, we're doing this for the neighborhood and we don't want any hotels on it or vendors or you know, Shake Shack or anything like that. And they successfully kept them away and the park is beautiful and it's a really serene, lovely place that is used by everybody. It's, I, every time I'm there, it's very well used. It's very simple, people fish and you know just sit there and watch it and, and it's a really is a, a neighborhood amenity that's really for everyone who lives in that area so i think that's a pretty happy story that it can happen that things like that can happen and it hasn't also harlem is redeveloping it the fact that the, they didn't allow private things into to interfere with the park doesn't mean that the neighborhood's not redeveloping it is but the pace is kind of slow um up here so that's great, thank you. So we have another question from someone who's here today. They ask, a lot of environmental justice issues are very local, but there are obviously environmental justice issues around the whole country. I know policy isn't your expertise, but how do you think about the scales of policy with regard to environmental justice? Should environmental justice issues be addressed locally or at a state and federal level? Um all of them <laughs> i think um i think that you know i think it's important to do it at all levels um and i don't think you know i think because uh, you know environmental law is very complicated so different entities have jurisdiction over different things so like some of the water bodies are regulated by the federal government, then you have the state that regulates other things. And, and so I think it, and like housing policy is, is a city thing mostly. So I think, it's, I think it should be a mix. I think it should be a coordination on every level. Great, thank you. I hope that answered your question to whomever asked. So the next question we have about your 2011 paper, and you touched on this before in talking about the park along the river, 
But in other areas, how has the situation in Harlem changed since 2011? Oh, right. Yeah. So um, there's been, you know, it's, it's Harlem is a really interesting place in terms of gentrification. Um, there's been some big changes, like there's a Whole Food now that went in in 2017 on the corner of Malcolm X Boulevard and, and um, 125th Street. That's a big deal. People, but the Whole Food is, is a, another space that is like being used by every... It's a, it's a really very diverse um, place where people from, you know, the neighborhood I think really was desperate for some better grocery stores. And so actually the Whole Food has sort of been a good thing for, for everyone in the neighborhood. Although people were very worried that it was like a signal of things to come. But what's, you know, Harlem has, um, it's again, it's changing, but it's much slower than I would have thought. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a lot of public housing in Harlem and there's a lot of subsidized housing in Harlem, like a lot. And that stuff hasn't been changing so rapidly. So these are things that are like federal subsidies. Um, they're either, you know, aside from public housing, they're section eight housing or they're um, buildings that have been set aside, you know, for um, rent that are, um, rent stabilized or HF, you know, sort of in these various kinds of city programs that are, are harder to change. Um, so it's not like private market housing that just with cheap rent, it's really things that are kind of under these programs. And, and that means that that stuff, it, it, it might eventually go away, but it's not going to go away in the, you know, it's not going away right now. So it's keeping a lot of people here in place. And um, it's not that people aren't getting displaced from Harlem, but it's still a very mixed area. Um, and uh, it's it hasn't like had the rapid change that some other neighborhoods have had. So yeah, so that's, I think, kind of good. I mean, I think um, so far, it you know, um, it's it seems like an example of, of mixed income um, kind of working out fairly well. It's great to hear. Thank you. And so the last very specific question about your essay um, it asks, what do you suggest is a better method of tracking progress in the realm of environmental justice and reform instead of the metrics of outcomes and valuations? Um, right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think the I think that I'm not, it's not so much that I'm necessarily opposed to the metric. Well, I think the problem with the metrics to me is that it's kind of easy to fudge them and they don't always mean what it seems like they mean. So when you're talking about like Plan YC or, or de Blasio's plan, which has followed and you, you go through and you look at the metrics and they'll say like, you know, we've implemented, like we planted this many trees, right? That's a metric, that's like a check, you know, or we've like um, redeveloped this many brownfield sites um, and we've like, you know, got reached our goals or whatever, but it's not telling you like where those things have happened or what the kind of um, context is in which they're happening. So you can check off all these boxes and say you've done all these great things that were set out by the plan, but it's not talking about the kind of ripple effects of them, like perhaps they've facilitated gentrification or the people that are getting to enjoy those things are not the people that have lived there for a long time or, or you know, or not low income people. So that um, it just sort of only, it's sort of like a, it sort of, um, decontextualizes the thing and just like looks like it's just on this checklist and it's very easy to make it look like you've done all this great stuff. Um, like one example could be like, um, like you can have Donald Trump saying like, you know, 50,000, whatever he says, like new jobs were created in the last month. And, and that's, you could say, well, that's a good, that's a big number. That sounds great, right? But it doesn't tell you that like this many jobs were lost right before that. And those jobs are actually what are coming back, you know? So it's really easy to sort of decontextualize those metrics. And that, that's sort of my problem with them. 
is not not that they exist at all, but that it's like they're sort of misleading. That's great, thank you. So moving um, to like more broadly speaking with the country as a whole, um, one person asks, do you see the same process in other major US cities? Also, does, this, does the constantly changing political climate at the national level have any effects on this process? Um, we'll see. <laughs> um, it could, it could, um, you know, like um, environmental justice and climate justice are issues that um, have been recognized by the Biden campaign. And he has, um, you know, uh, talked about it at length in his climate plan about equity and, um, and bringing back the, the ben, you know, the um, investing like of, of the however many trillions of dollars he wants to invest in green projects. 40% um, of that benefit, he wants to go to low income neighborhoods. So there's potential. Um, I think it's the kind of thing that people have to keep an eye on it. And again, it's it's sort of easy to uh, say things are one way and then you know the devil is in the details and, and like how they're actually really working out is another story. So I think like places like New York City and the fact that the sustainability plan um, sounded great and, and on paper, it sounds really good. And when it's, you know, reported on in other parts of the country, it sounds really good. But for the people that live here, it hasn't really worked out that well. So um, it's the same kind of thing. Like, you know, I think we can use that as um, a way to be like, okay, these are the things we should really keep an eye on um, when like there's a national policy rolling out. Great, thank you. So the next question we have is how can sustainable architecture and urban planning address issues of food insecurity that very much target marginalized, marginalized urban populations? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I am, I'm not sure if, do you mean food insecurity or food deserts? Um, I believe food insecurity in this case. Okay. Um, so food insecurity, I think, you know, I mean, I think it goes along with, I mean, that's sort of an issue of um, jobs and raising the minimum wage and, um, you know, um, giving people, you know, expanding food stamp programs, you know, these um, entitlement programs, rather than shrinking them and um, expanding access to them. Um, that's sort of, I, I mean, I'm not sure how much that relates back to the um, environmental, I mean, I think, you know, in, in New York City, one thing they did do was they, for a while, um, they expanded farmers markets into lots of different neighborhoods. And I think that was great. You know, the ones that I saw in Harlem were always very crowded and pop. And, you know, there are still some here and they're very popular and crowded and they're a little expensive though. So, but they take food stamps. So that's important, but it would be nice if the prices were maybe a little lower. Yes, for sure. That's great to hear. So looking on a more positive note, what has been the most successful fight against environmental gentrification that you've seen? Um, well, I think that that um, um, example from Anacostia, the one, I mean, again, it's still kind of in the works, but that so far has been um, something that I think has been really successful and really amazing how they, they just mobilized this huge community, again, of, of nonprofits and, and neighborhood residents really quickly, and they acted really fast and um, in a very coordinated way. So that seems to me like a really, so far, so, you know, a good model. That's great, thank you. So with the remainder of our time, the questions that I have structured are focused more on what we as students can do to help resolve the issue. But again, if anyone has any questions about anything related to Dr. Checker's expertise, don't hesitate to raise them. So the first prepared question I have is, as undergraduate students, what can we do to prepare for a career in environmental justice? Um, yeah, well, as undergraduate students, 
So, I mean, there's there's actually some great organizations that are really targeted to un, um, undergrads that are um, like a lot of there's climate a lot of climate action stuff, but it's it's all most of it includes a justice element, and I think that those are good ways to get involved. And some of the names are escaping me right now, and some of the names change, and so I might not be up on the latest. But you probably there's like Greek. Well, there's um, 360.org, right? And then there's the green, I think there was some green one. I think there's a lot though that are on campuses that are really trying to get people involved. And again, a lot they have done, a lot of those have done really good work about considering issues of equity and justice in them. So it's kind of all together now, like the climate and the environmental justice. So I think that's a great way to get started. And if you get really involved in those organizations and you know, a lot of times they'll hire people as organizers out of college, and it seems like a really good way to get going with it. Great, thank you. Um, the next question I have for you is what advice do you have for, I guess, just anyone to serve as an advocate for environmental justice? Um, you know, I think it's, it's to kind of look carefully at, um, to not assume necessarily that everything that is green is automatically good. Um, not that I think, you know, again, not, which isn't to say green is bad. It's just that sometimes it goes along with other things or it doesn't consider, um, you know, it's, it's not always equitable. So it's to kind of like look carefully. And like, if you hear about some green project going in this new park or new something going into a neighborhood that you know of, you think like, well, who's living there? And and how is this maybe going to change other parts of the neighborhood? And so to just kind of just think things through, I think it's like one of the main issues that comes up in my research is that a lot of this stuff is just really short sighted and it, it doesn't have to be so short sighted. Like it doesn't seem like it would be that hard to think more broadly about what the implications of these projects are. And, um, you know, it's sort of like, like throwing up high density housing, but what does that mean for the environment? It's just really like, you know, and th there are answers out there. The answers are, are there. And there's examples of people who kind of can do it in a way that is more forward thinking. So I think it's just thinking longer term. Great, thank you. So another question just popped up in the QA. Um, so thank you to whomever asked. Do you think the current environmental movements, e.g. the Earth Day Parade, are radical or moderate? What's the edge of act? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, a good, question too. Um, I think Earth Day does sort of sometimes tend to be a little bit, tend to be more moderate. Um, I mean, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I guess it probably depends on like where you are exactly. And, you know, I think there, I think what's happening is it's really changing, especially after the summer, you know, when people are becoming so much more aware of and concerned about structural racism, I think maybe that will shift things in in lots of different areas, including environmentalism. And I know that after, you know during the summer, a lot was coming up, more attention was being paid to environmental justice. Like for example, you know, the Biden climate plan, I mean, maybe it would have been that way. Otherwise, maybe not, who knows, but you know, like I think there's more attention on it right now and if, it, if we can kind of sustain that then I think it then you know it can become more part of the mainstream so you know that the, that these issues of justice can be incorporated. Great thank you so this one is a question of my own so previously I read an article by I believe it was Wilch et al in 2014 where they talked about how things need to be and I quote just green enough to where you need to like maintain like community support and like maintain like improvements and so on and so forth. Do you agree with um, their assessment of balance that balancing act that needs to happen? Um, I, you know, I, I think it's a great idea. I think, um, I think, you know, they're definitely think in a similar way to, to, to me and they're, you know, the stuff that they're looking at. Um, I haven't really, I don't know that many examples of it um, offhand where it's worked out so well, but I think, you know, it's a great idea if it can be done, you know, I mean, they're really, I think we're talking about very similar things, which is just like kind of looking at the whole picture and the context and, and not, um, 
and trying to sort of, yeah, um, make sure that everybody's benefiting from these these green amenities. So I think it's it's a, you know, it's a good concept um, if it can work. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's a very catchy concept. I was just curious about your thoughts on it. So some other questions that have been raised in the chat. Um, are you hopeful that we will see greater equity in the future? Yes. <laughs> I am hopeful. I mean, of course. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I, I think it's hard to say like the, you know, world is so crazy right now, but um, sometimes, okay. I'm not like, I mean, we're hitting some really hard financial times and it's terrible in a lot of ways and people are really suffering economically. So I'm not saying that I think that's a good thing in any way, but sometimes an economic downturn, it is good for the environment, you know, and just in terms of carbon emissions and slowing down, like if you look at the graphs of carbon emissions globally, um, the years where, it, the only years where it actually decreased in any significant way were 2009 to like 2011 when we had the last recession and you see it really dips. So sometimes like, so, in terms of climate, a downturn can be a good thing. And, and in terms of gentrification, it can kind of be a good thing because it slows everything down. Again, people are suffering and I'm not trying to diminish that at all, but maybe there's a lesson there somehow. That's great, thank you. So we just have two new questions in the chat. The first of which is from Kelsey who asks, what topics around environmental justice do you wish were studied more? Um, I, I mean, I think uh, sometimes I get concerned that there's like, we pay a little too much attention to the carbon emissions end of things and not enough attention to old, what I call old school toxics, which are, you know, like lead and soil or chromium or um, PCBs, like some of those old school things that aren't always like the kind of sexier part of greening or environmentalism, but are still like, you know, incredibly important because they're still poisoning people. So um, I wish that maybe, you know, I'm hoping, I hope that that continues to be front and center in um, what people are concerned about and, and studying. Great, thank you. So the next question is from Ludi, who asks, um, what possible implications the ongoing housing crisis in New York City may have during the COVID pandemic for sustainable development? With all the attention on the unbearable rent prices with no relief during the pandemic, could this tough time become a moment for possible positive and inclusive change? <laughs> I like the go CUNY, you forgot that. <laughs> um, I hope so. Again, I mean, I think that's sort of what I was trying to get at before again. And, you know, the pandemic has been very tough on people, especially in, you know, people of color and people living in low income neighborhoods. And that is really hard, but the rent prices are coming down here. They have come down considerably. And I'm hearing a lot from people I know who are, you know, getting much lower, good deals on like on places, which is helpful. And, um, you know, maybe um, if we can get, you know, people back employed and keep, you know, if you can find that sweet spot where the rents stay kind of low and, and people can be employed, then, um, that maybe people have time to take a breath. Um, but I don't know, it's really hard to say because again, like it's, it feels very kind of macabre to talk about any upsides to this. But I mean, uh, the, also though, I could say like the awareness about um, racial injustice, like that is an upside that more people are aware and um, actively fighting against it. Great, thank you. So another question we have asked is what skills will be useful for us to foster as undergrads if we would like to serve as advocates for environmental justice? Skills, oh, that's a great question. Um, GIS mapping is really helpful because um, it's really helpful to communities to have these maps. So everybody who wants to be part of environmental justice, it's really helpful. Um, also, there's some skills where you can learn about, um, like there's a lot of community science and there's some good examples now. It's taken a long time to get there, but there's some good examples of people doing like community-based science projects, public science, where you're collecting samples 
And you don't have to be a, like an expert. You don't have to be, um, you know, work for the EPA. You can, like there are community members that can carefully collect samples that are actually, you know, studied and taken seriously um, and used as evidence. And so like maybe, you know, learning, looking into that, there's like all kinds of nonprofits around that, that help communities do that, that help them learn how to do public science. And that's a really helpful thing to know. Um, and um, um, learning about, I think also like what, however your kind of city planning system works and knowing like at what points public intervention is, you know, asked for. A lot of people don't even sort of know that and like learning how to kind of intervene or, or have a voice in, in planning is helpful. Great, thank you. So another question we have is, what city in the United States has done a particularly good job at managing environmental gentrification, if there is one? Um, like citywide. Hmm. You know, I don't know if any city that is stands out. I mean, I know lots of articles and studies that show that it's a problem across the country. And there are a million examples of it, maybe not a million, but there are like thousands of examples of it. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a particular city that as a whole, like, you know, is like really kind of organized to prevent it from happening. Um, because even the cities that are known to be really progressive, like Portland has like a lot of examples of environmental gentrification and same with Seattle and, you know, so I, and and San Francisco, forget about it. So I don't really, I don't really have any, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Um, so we have some more questions. So another one is, as we move to new cities post-graduation, what can we do to learn more about environmental justice issues in those areas? Where do we start? Oh, that's a really good question too. I mean, you, a lot of places will have an environmental justice organization, that, at least one that's been around for a while. So even just kind of looking it up, like Googling it and trying to see what local coverage um, there is of, of different issues. But also um, another organization that's a mainstream organization that has really made a lot of strides in taking on environmental justice as a um, issue is the Sierra Club. And the Sierra Club has local chapters almost everywhere. And I mean, not all local chapters have taken it on as a cause, but a lot of them have. So you can also just check in with the Sierra Club and see what issues they're working on. And, and if they don't include environmental justice, you can be like, hey, well, what's happening? I mean, I, usually I can, if you drive around a city, almost any city in the country, and I've done this, you know, a lot of times, and you go to the poor neighborhoods or the neighborhoods where people of color live, um, you know, or predominantly people of color live, you'll see factories and you know, you could see it right there and then you can be like, oh, well, is this neighborhood organizing or doing anything about this issue? Great, thank you. So another question that we have is, what can we do to ensure underrepresented audiences are involved in decision-making and have a voice? Um, again, I think, you know, um, it's, again, it's a good question. I mean, there's so, so it's like, where do I start? Um, <laughs> besides just, you know, going and trying to amplify people's voices. And I mean, there's a lot of reforms I think that need to be made in our political system that make it less about campaign finance. Um, I think a lot of the changes to campaign, campaign finance laws, um, or, the, you know, the, the, they really kind of boost up um, the voices of large donors. And I, you know, I think that, that there's lots of proposals out there for reform. So that doesn't happen. And so that more people have a voice and it's not so much about like lobbyists or who's donated. And I think that's, you know, even if that happens at the national level I think it can filter down to the local level. Um, I mean, I think, you know, at some places have these, um, you know, um, yeah, I think there's, you know, it's, it's a lot about redistricting. I mean, it gets really into the weeds there. I mean, I think all that stuff is really important. I think um, 
running for office shouldn't have to be so expensive so that you have to have that much money behind you in order to do it so that you can, you know, run and, and represent people who can't give you a lot of money. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that can be done, but a lot of change needs to happen. Great, thank you. So we're nearing the end of our discussion. So I think we have time for one final question, but if anyone has any questions, uh, maybe put them in the chat and we can see about getting them answered. Um, but this final question is, what makes you hopeful about the future of the environmental justice movement? Well, um, that's, yeah, I, it's, I think it's you guys <laughs> because you know, when I, I speak at different colleges and I find that people really care about these issues and are really, I mean, I think, you know, it's like by the time um, people of, of your generation get into power, like climate change is not, it's not like anybody's going to be questioning whether climate change is real or should we, you know, believe the science, like that's just not even going to be an issue. It's just going to be a given. And, and that means like, you know, people are going to be doing something about it. And I think that it's, you know, the, the, the issues with racial injustice are also going to be much more sort of accepted and, um, and, you know, part of the conversation with that. And I, so I think that the awareness is, is fantastic among people in, on college campuses, and it gives me a lot of hope. And the commitment that I see and the energy around it gives me a lot of hope. So I always say, like, thank God that I am uh, a professor who teaches undergraduates because I don't know what I would do without you guys. <laughs> great, thank you so much. It's always great to hear a positive take on things. So we have a few more minutes left if anyone does have a question. Um, but before everyone goes, I want to make sure that everyone heard Erica's updates. Again, we have um, the talk on Dr. Checker's latest book tonight at 6.30. The Zoom link is in the chat. And if anyone would like to learn more about how to get involved with the Institute for Integrative Conservation here on campus, please visit their website, wm.edu slash IIC. As a member of the IIC, I can speak to the fact that it is a really great organization. I think the IIC has only been around for less than a year and they're already doing incredible things and they have an excellent focus on environmental justice. So again, thank you so much to everyone who came today and thank you for spending your lunch with us, Dr. Checker. Well, thank thank you. you guys. Thanks and I hope to see you later. Bye-bye.